You're listening to Real Folk with me, Joe Burke. <laughs> Hello, listener. Are you tuning in? Yes, you are. So today, uh, my lovely first guest is <laughs> Jackie Me. Hello. Hello, Jackie. Um, and you are, are you still mayor of Folkestone? No, um, I stepped down as mayor in May because we normally just do a year. Right. Uh, but I am still a town and district councillor. Oh, fabulous. And right. how long have you been doing that? I've been a town councillor for three years now and a district councillor for one. I was just counting back. Right. right. We haven't met before, have we? No, we we've haven't. been in uh, internet, Facebook uh, contact over. Are you having a charity fundraiser? Yes, we are. Well, when someone is a mayor, um, they adopt, for want of a better word, three charities. So you try and raise money during the year for your charity. And of course, I lost three months due to the COVID lockdown, and we had a big art and memorabilia auction uh, set up for the Leeds Cliff Hall. And I'm selling my bank thing. I've got a bank thing, oh. um, and it's hidden away safe. It's not in the house, <laughs> um, but it's a huge lump of concrete, basically. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, and I've had it for quite a few years now, and I thought, we can't put it on the wall. It's too heavy. Um, I had it in my hallway for a couple of years and broke my toes on it. I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> How did you come by a bank thing? Uh, that, that, that's that long that's a really long story, but th- th- that's a lot to do with... Um, having lived in London, being a musician for so many years, and also my partner as an artist and the people that we met along the way. Um, and the rest of that has to be a little bit hush, 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 hush. Ah. Um, but yes, so the, the banks have gone for sale, and of course it got cancelled because of the COVID lockdown. Yep. Um, which meant that my three charities, if I may, yeah, which is, uh, the Rainbow Centre, uh, the For Youth Project Charity, Living Words, um, who uh, work artistically with people with dementia actually lost out on a lot of money. Um, oh. So um, I asked the new mayor, Michelle, you know, would you mind if I did it in this year for my charities? And she very kindly said, yes, not a problem, uh, because we need a little bit of organisational help, shall we say, from uh, the lovely Tony, etc., at the town hall. Uh, so we're just waiting on the date. So I'm hoping it's going to be a year to the day. Okay, so it would have been in... Uh, it would have been in March. March. It was about March the 23rd, I think it was booked for. That's exactly when we were shut down, wasn't it? March yeah, the 23rd. yeah. Oh, so wow. we were lucky that we saw it coming. And hopefully we can almost use it, you know, because it will be a really big thing for Folkestone mm. because we've had some amazing artists actually put work in. I mean, really That's incredible. It. And you know Eddie Locke just... No, yeah. I don't Oh, know. Eddie, you've got to check his gallery out just down the road here. I mean, Eddie has been fantastic. He's given us vouchers and he's given us um, uh, an, a- uh, an Adams uh, print, which apparently, you know, the London artist, and he is the new London artist. So many people are being so kind. So we really want to make a big, big thing of it and draw a line under, hopefully, the COVID yeah. uh, and the fact that we can actually return to normal. That's yeah. what I'm hoping, and also raise a lot of money raise for Raise a lot the, of money for yeah, those charities. charities. Yeah, that is amazing. So if people want to, can people donate anyway to those things? I'll or? be honest with you, because it's a live auction, we've only got room for so much. Right. So I'll be honest with you, we've probably got what Enough. we need because That's everything that was donated in March, we just tucked away and put into yeah. sawdust, basically, yeah, yeah. because I knew that we would do it, but I wasn't yeah. quite sure when, but we're looking at March. Yeah. Um, so keep an eye out, because I will be shouting it from the top <laughs> of the town hall. Well, it'd be nice to have something positive. That would be great, and a nice start to the new year as well. Exactly. Just draw a line. Yep, that was Let's it. Let's move forward. That was 2020. We're just... We're just yeah, we'll forget that happened. <laughs> yeah, we'll forget that happened. Then just flip on to <laughs> 2021. Good. Good, good, good. And uh, I forgot to mention that we're recording this one at Custard HQ, which yes. is our gallery on the old, beautiful old high street in Folkestone. Uh, the reason I've called the podcast Real Folk is because uh, we are based here. We have been since uh, the end of October last Excellent. year. Yes. And we were only open a few months before we had to also mm-hmm. lock down, so that was fun. Um, but yeah, it's our creative home for, yes. for doing podcasts and artwork and books and the like. And the, the, the very first inaugural episode with Jackie, uh, previous mayor, current mayor for 21, just borrowing the mayor, yeah. <laughs> mayor all, sort of sharing it for next year, which is great, great, the spirit of sharing, fabulous. Um, so the reason, um, that sort of explains the reason mm. that how we sort of got to know each other, but we literally have only just met this very day, Yes. Um, and it's a very hot day too. Slowly melting. <laughs> 
Um, and the other reason was when I was talking to Jackie and saying, actually, I'm doing this podcast um, that was inspired by uh, being in Folkestone, calling it Real Folk, and I'm looking for people that have got just ordinary people with really interesting stories that I think should be told, because if they're not, they disappear, they do. And, uh, and I think it's a shame. So, so that's kind of the, the reasoning behind Real Folk. And when I had a chat online <laughs> with Jackie, what did you say? You said, well, actually, shall I send you an A4 page? <laughs> Of my life, because it's not been run of the mill. And she just mentioned a few things. I'm just going to say <laughs> that I just typed up a few things. So these are just notes. We'll try and cover as much okay. of these as we can. I, mean, I don't we know. We can always come back again. <laughs> For all of us. <laughs> Um, but so you, your dad, you were born. Your dad was fifty when you were yes, born. Yes, yes. I'm an only child. My dad was fifty, and my mum was forty. So that is which back in the sixties was very unusual. Uh, yeah, I mean that's quite normal now for women in yes, their forties. Yes, but, but back not then, at the time. No. no, no. So do you think was that a, a good thing? But had they were they so laid back because of that? Do you think? Or? Um, my my parents were uh, wonderful people, but sort of like so polar opposites of each other. It was unbelievable. Um, because my dad had, um, was of the age where he'd been in World War Two. Uh, my dad was actually SOE, which was undercover, and he was flown into Crete and Greece and all sorts of places. Wow. Um, so he, he had a very military type, you know, everything's black and white, you either do this or you do that. Right. And that's fine. And my mum was brought up in Southern Ireland, um, in Tipperary, and was very a artistic. Long way. Yeah, <laughs> tell me. How did I look that far? Um, and was very artistic and learnt how to play Hawaiian guitar and, you know, loved painting. So you put the two of them together and it was just this strange mishmash yeah. um, of, of, of a household. Uh, and our grandmother, who, um, I mean, she died when she was 90-odd. So she must have been about 70-odd when she took over looking after because both my parents worked. Um, and I actually started speaking in a really strong Irish accent as a kid. Um, because obviously I've been brought up on my friend. Yeah, yeah. 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 I so bet I she had some stories. I wish I met her. Oh <laughs> gosh, yes. They used to have the family farm. Um, my nan remembered uh, the Titanic on uh, actually um, uh, leaving from Dublin. Wow. She was 12, so that was 12 years old. 1912, I think. Yeah, she was 12 Titanic? years old. <gasps> 12 in 1912. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And she did have some amazing stories. I bet. <laughs> and that's my point. You see, they've gone now. So yeah. You need to catch them. Well, they haven't people. because I've you got have them all in them. here. That's good. <laughs> You're the caretaker of those. Absolutely. And, and one of my other notes was uh, you, you started a band when you were 15, but you mm. learned the piano because you broke your hand, fingers. Yes, like, what, what, what happens, I was brought up in sort of the Wimbledon area. And I was born in Chelsea in 1965, so swinging London. <gasps> uh, and my parents moved uh, to Wimbledon because I could afford a house there. Uh, not the posh part of Wimbledon, I hasten to add. Um, and I used to go to a school called Don Donald Primary School. And one of the things I used to love doing is swinging on uh, the gates um, of the school, you know, waiting for my nan or my mum to pick me up. And I still remember I was about three and a half, and there were two boys swinging on the gate, and I didn't realise I'd grabbed the wrong part of the gate, and they were swinging, and they actually crushed ah. three of my fingers uh, on my left hand. So the doctor, very sensibly to my mum said, if you want her to continue using her left hand, you need to put her on the piano. Brilliant. So I always remember my mum every week putting a couple of, you know, pounds away and managed to, 15 pounds this piano cost. Wow. And it then, <laughs> 15 pounds, you know, from a junk shop, uh, totally out of tune, but it didn't matter. <laughs> um, and they started me straight away on the piano to strengthen up my left hand. And did you love it, or was it a, a was it literally? A I, I just always <laughs> loved music, and I, obviously they told school that she needs to do music, etc. So I went into the recorder class, which is where they taught you to read music, uh, and I could actually read music before I could read English. Interesting. And I ended up because um, I, I, I did sort of cello, violin, uh, you know, all sorts of things. I just loved music, um, and ended up playing something like I think it was about thirteen different musical instruments. By the time you know, sort of and can you still play them now? Yes, yes. Every now and again, I get dragged out uh, <laughs> to an open mic. I tend to only go out uh, for charity, to be quite honest with you, um, but because I ended up being a singer-songwriter in various bands, and um, you know, played played in front of nearly a quarter of a million people at one point, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, old rock Just and roll a few chick. Then. Old rock and roll chick. Nice. Um, but um, what it allowed me 
to do was actually express myself because I can't draw. I'm looking at the amazing drawings in here. I, I'd stick insect man. You oh, know, me that's too, me. me too. The amazing drawings <laughs> Jackie speaks of are not mine. Uh, they're, they're my husband, Philip Price's beautiful artworks that are all up there inside the Custom HQ. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the easiest thing I found is I'm going out solo because uh, when I was in rock band, my main instrument was the bass guitar. Nice. And I love, I love, yeah. I love the bass guitar. Um, but it's a bit difficult to go out and sing a song just to yeah. a bass. It, it, it's yeah. a bit awkward. So um, I'd go out with a semi-acoustic and uh, bust out a couple of the oh, old numbers. Oh, I love it. I love it. I did, I did the same when I was younger. I used to, do, I used to write songs and I, I got together. I didn't know we're near the audiences your size, Jackie. No, <laughs> no, no. But no, I did, I did learn the guitar. Um, but I, at my school, it was really weird. You had to learn classical guitar. So we only learned oh, okay. like Spanish but I taught myself, oh, see, but this is the trick, you see, because I learned all the classical at school, and I'd, I've always been a big believer that once it clicks as to how music works, you can pick up almost any instrument. Right. Um, the one instrument I... Well, I can pick them up, I can't play them. <laughs> the one instrument I've always had problems with is the reed instruments, because I haven't been taught how to blow through a reed, so saxophone... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the rest of them, with a bit of perseverance, you can do it. Yeah. You Have you got one go-to tune for my brother? Just my, <laughs> my brother. I can play, I can play, I'll back down, I've had a father with <laughs> any, any <laughs> instrument. <laughs> um, on the guitar, it's probably one of my own ones um, that's called Chasing Rainbows. We did a great gig with my uh, first band called Dark Pastures, and we had a great drummer called Brian. And even 40 years on, oh, that shows how old I am. <laughs> well, I'll delete on, that, I'll delete it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're still all in touch with each other. Oh, how lovely. It was that's such nice. a friendship. Yeah, um, and good drummers are hard to find. And the funny thing was that Brian um, looked very... Um, Stark isn't the right word, but startling because he had very jet black hair and he had very pale skin. And he had an older brother who looked almost identical to him. And one of them was right-handed and one of them was left-handed. So just for a laugh at one of the gigs, we set up two drum kits. And we went into the dun, 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 and the screeching guitar and opera singing over wow. the top of it. And his brother suddenly came on stage and they started doing the rolls around the drum kit with it. So it's like there was a mirror oh. down the middle. And it was just, oh, uh, amazing. One of the best uh, things I've been involved in on stage. Yeah. That was just really yeah. uh, amazing. Do but you yes, miss being on stage? I am on stage. I'm a politician. Well, you're a yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, do you miss playing music on stage? Um, not so much. Uh, the, being in a band is a lot of dedication, yeah. a lot of hard work and a lot of money. Mm. People don't realise how much money is involved because you've got to keep your equipment going, you've got to update it, uh, but also you've got to pay for rehearsal space, yes, really etc. Et 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 um, and the problem is everyone's life gets in the way. So you get yourself one really good band together and then someone goes off and yeah. gets married and the girlfriend or the boyfriend doesn't want them to do it anymore. Yeah. So you then have to go through the whole thing again to get people in. So being rather self-sufficient, um, I'm sort of quite happy just to wander yeah. in and out of um, open mics every now and again. Yeah, no, it's a, lov <laughs> it's a lovely thing to be able to do. Um, and also, just saying, one of the things you mentioned, mm. I don't want to, you know, you probably don't want to talk about it, Jackie, I shouldn't think. Mm, do. What have I done? Uh, you mentioned David Bowie. Oh, yes, David Bowie. Well, the beautiful thing was, back in the 80s in London, um, and I was pretty good, uh, especially on the bass guitar, and I used to do session work and stuff, and I used to get paid for it. Uh, so you, know, you meet all sorts of different people, and, yeah. um, and being in London, you know, rehearsal studios, um, you used to have Skunk and Ants in. Oh, and oh yeah, I mean, you know, um, to Pal, we're using the same I studio. I used to love the Carol <laughs> Decker, the big Asian She hair. nicked the last tea bag one day, and Did I've never forgiven her. The Decker, she's known for that, you know, <laughs> she's known for that. Don't let her near your next cafe. <laughs> you used oh, to, no. honestly, and you were just part of the gang, and no one was held up over anyone else but there, there was oh sorry I, 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 I could ramble on forever <laughs> no, but there, was, there was this really funny story that we went down to Alaska Studios one Sunday which was our normal one and Bucks Fizz were in there <gasps> okay now what I didn't realise all of the Fizz were in there yeah the original the lineup the Fizz yeah <laughs> But, um, and th th they were doing it, it was, I think it was Jay was her name, it was her birthday or something, and stuff like that. Anyway, they were in the rehearsal room next to us, and we were sort of like fairly rocky, but we could really rock it if we wanted to, but it was all original stuff. Anyway, we were sitting there just having a chat about the next thing, and all of a sudden, in the next room, we could hear 
Buck Spears doing whatever you want by status quo. Really? And we, of course, we were just falling on the ground laughing because we never thought that Buck Spears would do that. So we just all looked at each other and said, let's show Amanda do it, lads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything <laughs> went up to number 11. Up to 11, yes. We love the up to 11. <laughs> but yeah, sorry, the David Bowie thing. So we um, used to... Um, so I was in girl bands and we knew um, a, a lot of the guys that were actually making it quite big. Um, we used to get backstage parties, uh, which was great. And um, I went to one backstage and then you basically you went for a free drink, let's be honest. Of course you did, of um, course. And, uh, sort of there. and there's a chap there and said, oh, oh, Jackie, I just want to introduce you to someone. I said, oh, okay, and it's JJ there. So I said, and he took me over and it's David Bowie. <gasps> so, when was, so what year would this oh, have been? Oh gosh, this would have been... Early 90s. I'm just trying to work out what they would have been, been counted. Hold on, hold on. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, it would have been early 90s. So he would have been, so he would have done uh, I think, I think Let's Dance. Yes, yeah, he'd done all that. And I, th- I think he was starting to go into the tin machine yeah, ah, era yeah, yeah. at that point. Anyway, so, th- 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 you know, so, oh, let me introduce you to David. So he said, oh, hello, my name's David. Who are you? <laughs> no shit. And I sort of, <laughs> looking at my friends, so, oh, hi, I'm JJ, nice to meet you. And you sort of like, and then you sort of back off and bow, you know. <laughs> anyway, about two weeks later, I was with another group of friends, another backstage, you know, get a few um, beers, and uh, someone comes straight up to me. I said, oh, tap me on the shoulder. I said, oh, hello, I'm David. I don't know if you remember me. We met a couple of weeks ago, JJ. No way. Well, I swear to God, my friends fell to the floor. <laughs> I go, oh yeah, hi David, how it's going? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you want? Stop following me, David. <laughs> but it, it, it just shows Get your own friends. He was such a lovely guy. Oh, that's lovely. So apart, yeah. you know, away from all the publicity and, you know, he's the, you know, the, the, the dude and everything else. He was such a nice guy and he remembered people's names. That's Which incredible, isn't it? Amazing. When you think how many people oh, they gosh. meet that, you exactly. know, when you're at that stage of your exactly. career. Exactly. Well, I remember from the mayor last year, and I keep seeing faces I know, and I can't remember names. And please, believe me, if you listen to this, I do apologise. It's, not, it's <laughs> not rudeness. It really isn't. It isn't. Do you know what I forgot this morning? I think yeah. we, Phil and I have these, what we call, old people's home moments. <laughs> I had a shower this morning, and in the shower, I couldn't remember whether I'd washed my hair, so I had to wash my hair twice. Oh, wow. That, I said, I think I've got an early onset. He went, no, everyone does that. I said, no, they don't. You don't. I bet you haven't done I that. Have I you? haven't done that. No, no. see? I've done a lot of dodgy. stuff, but I haven't it's done that. <laughs> but that's the first time, like, hello. Yeah. So, yeah, so I had to, you know, I'm like, did I wash it or not? Better do it again. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> but also, like, we used to know people like girls' school who had number one hit with Motorhead uh, and Lemmy. And we used to go to the parties yeah. backstage. Wow. And again, you see... Everyone's like, oh, Lenny, you know, tough old rocker. I'll tell you something, that man was such a gentleman around ladies. Aww. He really was. He was lovely. Didn't suffer fools gladly when it came to men, but around the girls, I never heard him say anything out of order. Ah, amazing. And we, we've missed, we've lost two really, really good people there. Yes, and actually, you could almost blame David Bowie for the demise of the whole world. Because <laughs> it is since he passed. <laughs> Well, he did write that song, didn't he? Five years. So thanks, Dave. Thank you. Um, So yeah, so that's. I mean, crikey, what an interesting part of your life. So Mm. how how long a period was that for? That that was from the age of fifteen. I played my first gig at the age of fifteen in a band at the Clarendon in Hammersmith, which is no longer there. I was told at the age of thirty-two because I went through and over the years we were offered about six record contracts from major record companies. Uh, and I turned them all down um, because if you sold your music, you weren't allowed to use it yourself. So there, there were some very strange deals going on at that time. Um, and by the age of 32, I could still get away for about 27, uh, but it's come to 33, they sort of said, no, 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 you know, you're too old, you can't do this anymore. So, oh, fair enough, I'll go and do something else. Yeah. Not a problem. And then at the age of dun, 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 40, I got called back into the music business because a friend of mine is a luthier. And for those who don't know who a luthier is, is there's someone who actually um, makes from scratch but also repairs musical instruments. Okay. And it's a friend of mine, Lisa. And um, 
she, she was there with her head in her hands one day and she said, God, I, JJ, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I said, what, why? What, 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 what's up? And she said, I can't keep my project going anymore. And I said, what project is this? And I'd known for years. And she said, oh, I recycle musical instruments and I give them out to community projects and teach oh, kids lovely. how to play music. Oh, that's amazing. And I said, well, we've got to do something about this. Yeah. So I said, well, what do you want to do? And she said, I thought we might put a gig on. And I went in typical my form. I think we can do better than that. Within, I think it was six weeks, uh, via the old MySpace, if anyone remembers that, yeah. we'd got seven venues, <gasps> 140 artists and bands. Wow, that's And incredible. we put on over, and it was the hottest Easter for 20 odd years, Crikey. which was great. Over those venues, um, we had whole days of music. Uh, all donated by the bands. No one charged us a penny, not even for petrol. Um, and we put on a free fun day for the kids as well with all live music and everything else. Um, and we called it Replay Music. And we raised enough money, even though I put it originally on my credit card, which was a, a bit dodgy, to be quite honest with you <laughs> at the time. But we went back into profit and we raised, a, I think at the time it was £17,500. Oh, weekend. that's amazing. Work. Now that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but where I lived in South London, which was Mitchell at the time, the average income for like a, a two-person with kids family was just over £12,000. Amazing. And that money helped Replay continue and they've now been working, uh, going strength to strength, and they help run the kids field at Rattenbury each year what a lovely legacy That's and i'm amazing. still involved with them yay um have you been to glasgow then i take it you oh gosh been. many many yeah. moons i still haven't yeah. been it's on my bucket list it's oh, on, I, I, yeah. I went in 1984 so who was the lineup then uh we had joan baez elvis costello uh fella Kunte, um, I can't remember who some of the, the bigger names were, but it was a really big... We were lucky we didn't have the mud. You didn't get the slime. But I tell you, <laughs> I still have nightmares about the toilets. Uh, that is the oh thing, isn't it? Lord. See, I don't really do camping, but now <laughs> we've obviously we've moved on and there's, there's this glamping. Glamping, yes. I think I might be able to be on board with the glamping. Yes. Well, Glastonbury is like this whole city that gets together yeah. for about two weeks and then disappears again. Yeah. And you have birth, death, marriages. Yeah. You know, like you do with anything. But um, for me, I mean, they're, they're up to, I think, about 300, 350,000 people. That's a bit it too is. big for me. That's yeah. a bit too big it for me. It is big. It is huge, isn't it? But um, I, funnily enough, because they obviously, again, 2020, <laughs> To you. <laughs> um, they basically cancelled, obviously, Glastonbury. Yes, but everything's going to come back bigger and better it next will, year. It will, it will. But interestingly, I actually still enjoy Glastonbury because they played a lot of the highlights. Yes, did they you did. see the David Bowie? Oh, yes. So they played the whole of his set, which apparently had know, never been shown before. And he wasn't very well at the time. Uh, really? Yeah. 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 He wasn't well. When because he was it, was a, it was a really long set. And then uh, I read somewhere afterwards that actually uh, when it went out, uh, at the time, mm. it was only four or five songs that went out, and the set that they played, played this year yes. was about an hour's worth of his mm. music. Yeah. It was amazing. Well, a couple of years ago, uh, which was probably the one gig that I will always remember for Glastonbury, is the Iggy Pop gig. Ah. And I don't know how many of you remember, but we were obviously watching it on the TV, uh, and when he actually got the crowd up on stage. Now, there's not many... Um, superstars, rock stars that would number one take that risk no. but number two be able to control those people as well and everyone was so well behaved and it just looked absolutely amazing Yeah. so yeah, yeah hats up to Izzy as well yes, indeed, <laughs> indeed. if you're hearing a small child bawling that's because they've just wandered past <laughs> the one thing you will hear a lot of dear listener is seagulls, children and you're drunk <laughs> Hey, that's life in folks. But that's just me and Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the other little notes I've got for you are that um, you had something to do with the 2012 Olympics. Oh, yes. Well, when they chucked me out of the music business, before I sort of got back into it, and yeah, by the way... you're too old. What? And by the way, Replay, um, after the festival, won two international music awards. Nice. And there were only three of us that arranged it. That's amazing, isn't it? So we're really chuffed with that. Um, but so, uh, obviously, 
you've got to find something else to do yeah. with your life. Uh, and also, whilst I was working, I also kept a full-time job because you could never be absolutely sure of money coming in. You know what it's like. I know the drill. Yeah. That's yeah. what we were just saying. You know, you if know you're in any like. kind of performance, it's it, people think you're doing all right, but it's normally because you're doing about four different other things. See, yeah. <laughs> you know, treading water desperately. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, and I managed to get... Um, a, I've done various jobs. I was a, a recruitment manager. I had 250 staff underneath me. I was in print and publicity. All sorts of bits and pieces. Um, but then I managed to get a job with London Underground. And I started off as a support manager uh, because I had no qualification as such. I had lots of life experience, but I must admit I was not the most academic at school. Um, and... So don't um, worry all those people that no, have been disappointed no. with your A-level results. And um, I was a support manager on projects, learning my trade, shall we say, for a couple of years. Uh, and then I managed to get promoted up to, the, oh gosh, they gave us all different names and titles, titles but yeah. basically it was project managing uh, things. And uh, it was sort of poodling along, quite happy, absolutely loved my job, thank you very much. Uh, yes, woo woo, London wins the Olympics, yeah, it's like six years goes by. And then someone in London Underground gave me a little ring and they said, um, I think you might have a problem. I said, oh, OK, that's interesting. What's going on? And we have a thing called a risk log, which actually uh, it's almost like a to do list. Right. That's, that's how I yeah. describe it, to make sure that these things are dealt with. And they popped it over to me and I thought, oh, oh yeah, we've got a problem. So I actually contacted the Olympics team for London Underground. Uh, and ended up having a two-hour shouting match with them across the table because they'd never done projects before and they thought that everything was going hunky-dory and I was desperately trying to explain to them, actually, no, it isn't. It isn't. Um, but they didn't want to know because they thought they had a handle on it. And that was in the October. And then, ooh, five days before the Christmas, I get a phone call from my boss saying, um, oh, we've just been told that there's an opportunity to join the Olympics team. I said, oh, really? Funny that. Mm. <laughs> I said, what you're telling me is they've done nothing for six and a half years and they're wanting to come and sort it out for them. Yeah. Uh, and sort of went, uh, well, yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds exactly like, so do you remember the series that was on? Oh, yeah. It was called yes. 2012, yes. wasn't it? Yeah, and then it 2012. went into WC1, yeah. amazing yeah. programme. So it was basically true. They were uh, oh, yeah. quite incompetent. And everyone, then... everyone just thought, oh, no, we've got plenty of time, we've got plenty of time. <laughs> oh, oh my Lord, is here. <laughs> so I basically had 16 weeks to close out nearly a thousand projects. Oh. Um, I was given a team, luckily, of some really, really good people, and I used to send them out doing this, doing that. And we had really good fun with it as well, because it was pressurised. And, um, you know, we had people like, um, doctors like Railway, sort of like, um, contacting me and saying, oh, oh, can we have a copy of your documentation? And I'd say, no, you can't. I said, oh, why not, why not? I said, because I haven't written it. It's yet. not there. <laughs> I said, you may not realise that we haven't had the Olympics since 1947, so we have no documentation. Was that the last time, 1947? I think it was wow. 47. It was either 46 or 47. It must be 46, cause it's, um, yeah, because we offered to do it after the war. Oh, uh, right, okay. And that was the last time that yeah. London had it. It was amazing, though, and that's what I think is a shame, talking about 2012 Olympics, because... It was such a thanks to amazing. Jackie. No, no, no. <laughs> it no, was, no. That's, um, that's a whole it team. was like such an amazing time. Mm. It really felt like everyone pulled together, and it, it the was feeling in London was, something was to be amazing. Proud of. It was amazing. We're still capable of coming together and doing absolutely amazing things. We've seen that in Folkestone. Yeah, that's true. Really, yeah. really locally with uh, the hub and all the volunteers that have come forward to help everybody else. Yeah. And that's the same thing. It's just that we've not got a big celebration. This time, we're keeping people safe. The feeling that I had when the Olympics was on and I was working in Islington when mm. that was going on, and it was such a buzz. Wasn't it? <laughs> it, it was. It was a real was. buzz. And also a, pa a pain in the bum as well, because they did... You couldn't get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's, let's not forget those things. But, I mean, we, we, everyone, nobody minded. It was all worth it. And... All the volunteers were yeah, incredible, amazing. and the opening and closing ceremonies yeah, were amazing. Oh, really? yeah. oh, wow. And I was at the rehearsal. Oh, man. Um, no, it was That quite, is amazing. amazing. And amazing. We, I, I felt that there was such a, a pride that I, I sadly, I, like you're saying, it's like right, those people, we're all still here, those mm -hmm. same people, but you feel a bit squashed. It's hard to not feel a bit squashed, and I think it's, it's 
with, for instance, yeah. the refugees and the, the yeah. way the media is reporting things now. Yeah. Um, the, peop- the, the media, media is, is not reporting things in a positive light. very negative. Yes, exactly. Um, but it's up to every one of us to look at things positively. Yes. And every time I've had anything, and you've got other lists in front of you as well, but any time that I've had a real, real knockback on something, I've gone, okay, how what have I learned yeah. from that? Right, how do I turn this into a positive? Yeah. Let's do And this. that's so important. And I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I am the same. I mean, I, I, although I'm saying, oh, I don't feel as proud as, as, as being British as I did. Um, and obviously this COVID has knocked everybody. Mm. Um, but, you know, this has come out of it, yeah. for example. Exactly. Which I feel is a really positive thing for, for folks. Yeah. And, and, and also just people's mental well-being because mm. I think it's important for people to hear yeah. other people's journeys and I think especially um, especially women in fact actually when you get like past a certain age like you say yes. that, that industry didn't want you you get booted out but actually you sort of go through your life trying to avoid being pigeonholed because everyone wants to just go oh well that's Joe and she's this yes or that's yep. or that's Steve and he's that when in actual fact what I'm hoping these podcasts will prove is that actually Joe is a million things, exactly. Jackie is a million things, <laughs> exactly. the person standing next, next to you year. on the tube or in the yes. shopping queue or you know at the train station is a million things. Yeah, yeah. at that moment they're a commuter going to possibly a job in town that they don't like yeah. and they come home and they're this magician or something. Yes, you know, a you track don't, dancing you don't, or, yes, you know. You don't know and, and that's what I really want to get behind, I mm. want to get the, the stories behind the, the initial facade that people mm. see. And I think that takes me back onto another important thing, which is judging. Yeah. Where everyone is very quick to judge mm. these days, and and that's part of the pigeonholing process, isn't it? You mm. know, if people go, oh, okay, I get that, because I can understand you are this, and that makes it easier, or you look this way, so yeah. you must be that. Yes. But you know, it isn't at all. I'll give you a, a very quick example, if I may, but it's on a, a slightly wider scale. When I was 37, I got cancer, um, and people go, oh, it won't get you. That, that's fine. And it was cervical cancer. Right. Um, and to cut a long story short, yes, they treated it. I used to paint my toenails with glitter nail varnish wow. so that when I went in, uh, all the nurses could have a giggle so we didn't take it too <laughs> seriously. You know? Yeah. So I got over it and um, and it was a case of that could have been it. It could have been. That and it makes you it. reassess, doesn't it? So um, you know, people say, well, if, if you'd had like a bucket list, what have you done? I said, the one thing I hadn't had a chance to do is do some travelling. So they said, go do some travelling. Yeah. So I literally, at the age of 37, rucksack on my back. Good for you. Um, and travelled around Europe. And am I right? Did you leave your husband behind? Yes, I did. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, someone, had to feed, someone had to feed yes, the cat. Yes, you yeah. look after the house for the moment, I'm off. Yeah. And everyone's like, aren't you scared, aren't you scared? And I said, I'll be honest with you, probably 99.9% of the people out in that world mean you absolutely no harm whatsoever. I said, and if you're really unlucky enough to come across that point zero one percent, yeah, just have your brain on, yeah, and it's just so be careful. Uh, and I had an amazing time, and I'm still friends with some of the Kiwis that I Yay. met over there, and you know I've got pretend God's children all over the world. Uh-huh. But that was because I could have gone in with blinkers yeah. and just you know kept very much to myself. But no, you talk to everyone, you meet everyone, and yeah. people are wonderful. Yeah, they really are. But again, I think sometimes. Um, Governments prefer us to be scared, and I think that's they what the like, media does. Because yeah, we're more, like we're more in their us. pocket, then, aren't we? Yeah. And if you keep people scared, people are more exactly. likely to do what you want. As them they're to. told, and not do yeah. those things. And I think that that's yeah. that's really hit the nail on the head. And also, I think what's interesting, and it happens to a lot of people, uh, when you have that kind of epiphany, when you have a life or death situation, and you mm. have an illness, either your own or someone close to you, mm. it is that kick up the arse. Yeah. To go, it's just well, wake up you know, call. we're not here. We're not here it's that long. Nobody call. knows. So, what did I want to do? What should I be doing? Yeah. Because so many people go, oh, you know, I'll do that when I retire. Yeah. No, no, you don't, know, don't. Why and do stuff? The other thing that it really did me, it proved to me I could do anything. Yeah. Uh, the, the bravery it gave me and the confidence to just go, well, you know what? I'm gonna give it a go anyway. Yeah. If I don't make it, then great. I'll learn from that and I'll still yeah. win. Yeah. So I always, you know, people say, oh my God, you know, how did you do that? How did you do that? And yeah. like, I go, because I tried. Well, people are frightened of failure. And the thing is, there really isn't any such thing as failure. Yeah. Because 
Well, I suppose there is if you don't learn from it. You yes, know, yes. But if, if you, you just repeat you, and repeat yeah, and repeat. because, you know, yeah. once is a mistake, twice is intentional. You, you yeah. know, if Three you, times, <laughs> go and lock yourself in the cupboard. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's what so many, and I get that a lot because I've done a lot of different things and, and pe- people do think you've got some specialness about you that allows you, and, and really we yeah. haven't, you yeah. know, really everything that I've done in my life, I'm from a working class, I'm a plumber's yeah. daughter, council yeah. plumber's daughter, my mum was a dinner lady, you mm. know, at the local school. Uh, we, you know, we and all such necessary much. jobs. Yes, often it can be perceived that if you if you follow your dreams or follow your passions, that that somehow you're different to, mm. the, to, to other people and there's an otherness, and there really isn't. And if you can sort of get that message across and not not have people wait for. In my case, it was losing my dad that was my kick up the yeah. arse when I was 22. Um, in your case, I mean, you were le- you were pretty much <laughs> on the right track anyway. But that, that was an well, extra. Well, no. Piece. But you see, th- th- where that came from is I saw what happened to my mum because my mum had a major brain hemorrhage and a stroke when I was twelve years old. Oh wow! And you've got to remember, I'm an only child with an elder father. Father, so you know. So yeah. my father was out at work now trying to cover two people's wages. Right. Uh, so I became a home carer for my mum. Mom. Yeah, uh, and I saw all the struggles that she went through, and and as you do as a younger person, and uh, I, I know a lot of older people are sort of like very worried about all these youngsters going and, and meeting up without masks, etc., etc. But you've got to remember, when you're young, you think you're invincible. Of course, yeah. And you think it will never happen to you, and it's not until it does happen to you that you suddenly go, oh, okay, I've got to rethink this. Mm. How do I want to do this? Yeah. So I had sort of two major things. One happened to my mum, and then it happened to me, and yeah. I thought I can't have it, it it repeating itself. No, can't have it repeating itself. So I've got to go and grab life grab and it. really yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. And and with t- just talking about cervical cancer, that um, <laughs> when you said it, it's, it's a it's a ridiculous thing. I always said um, that's one of the good ones to get because oh, it actually yeah, you, you can, can catch you it. can do yeah. So yeah. that's why it's really important to go for your smears. And oh, absolutely. To, um, just while we're speaking, and that it. again, you see the positive thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because all of my friends, because I wasn't quiet about it, I told all my Everyone, friends, yeah. and next thing you know. They all went because nobody likes it, ladies. No, no. but believe me, it no. saved my life. Yeah, absolutely saved my life. Yeah, and so you're, just I, I know several people that have mm. unfortunately had that, but fortunately, as I say, yeah. it's one of the good ones. Yeah, but you catch you it need quick. To catch it quick. Catch it quick, and you never. Have and a it is an awful experience, and I'm terrible. I'm probably like everyone else out there listening. That I'm, I really put it off. I'm really, you know, I have to psych I'm myself slap your up wrist. for it. But <laughs> I do. I have to psych myself up for it. I, you know, it's really. And I think, I think partly it's because I'm a bit known for oversharing, so I'll overshare a little bit. <laughs> um, I've got what they call a uh, uh, tilted... Oh, til- uh, it's cervix. Tilted cervix, there yes, you go. Thank yes. you for reminding me, because I forgot myself. Which makes it much harder... For, so, for yeah. the, if if you get yes. a really really good nurse, they know what they're then doing. Then they, they yeah. know what they're doing, and it's like, oh, you did that wasn't too bad at all. However, I have had some awful experiences, so yeah. I do always have. But even though I do have awful experiences, I have always forced myself to go. But I must admit, sometimes it's like a couple of months late because yeah. I just can't face it. I just can't yeah. face it. And they do that thing, don't they? Which <laughs> to make you sit down and then just say. Oh, and just relax, just put your legs... Yeah, like, oh, oh, yeah, man alive. This but is, then, yeah, this is, is how I relax. This is, this is where the glitter <laughs> nail varnish comes good, in onto yeah. your toes, <laughs> you know? No one can be too serious if there's glitter everywhere. No. What can I say? And can I just also say, again, oversharing, <laughs> that I did have a smear where, you, I know this is not pleasant, everyone's had them, uh, they, they clamp you, oh, don't yeah, they? Oh, yes. But at that point, so I'm legs akimbo and with the clamp, <laughs> the nurse went, tapped all round her, she went, oh, I haven't got the, uh, oh, I need to find the, uh, I won't be a minute. And <laughs> oh, she God. went, oh, <laughs> no! She left the room. She left the room. She didn't uh, lock the door. It was oh all no. was shut, but there was no <laughs> lock. And I'm thinking, how how am I going to, if I have to hop off of here, how am I going to hop off <laughs> of this thing? A fire alarm starts <laughs> going, and then you're in real trouble. <laughs> so I thought I'd just share that for you. I, I know you're glad that I did, listener. <laughs> 
Oh. So yeah, they, they can be horrible. And I still go after that. She did yeah. that to me. So yeah, anyway. But let's, always look after your health, ladies. Yeah, yeah. No, it's so, it's so important. And um, and I think, you know, if you can try and encourage people to, to not wait for something to remind you that you haven't necessarily got mm. all the time in the world to do stuff, it's, mm. it's quite valuable mm. to people. And um, although you'd never wish on your worst enemy those no. things, no, if you can not. pass on what you learned from that, which exactly. is what I have tried to do, and uh, encourage people to do oh, yeah. what they want to do rather than waiting and thinking yes, no, there's, never wait. there's another day and another time when that will be mm. better to do. And of course, I never thought in a million years that I'd be helping to deliver the Olympics. No. And the London Underground, which is now part of London for Transport, um, actually has minted 150 gold coins, Olympic gold coins. Um, and I suddenly got an invite across my desk. Uh, oh, you need to come to this, like, Gigi Poos and whatever, you know, to say, well done for the Olympics. Anyway, I turned up, and there's obviously loads of people I know there. Uh, and I said, right, you've all got a line up here. I thought, what's going on there? And no one had told me that I'd actually been awarded one of these gold coin. medals. Oh, oh, no, no, it's not a coin. It's a medal. It's a medal. It is the same size as an Olympic gold medal, and it was made by the people uh, who make Odeons and Indians. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. They, so they you still got that Yeah, that's part of my pension oh. plan. But the funny thing was, we all had to trap us up on the stage in the thing. And uh, Mike Brown, who was our CEO at the moment, who's now head of... London transport, I'm much bigger now. But I knew Mike, I used to share my chips with him in the uh, lift. <laughs> uh, and he came out, and you had to literally, you had to lean over like you're on a podium, and he, and he put this medal around your neck. Aww. And then there was this lovely chap with ginger hair who like handed you a bunch of flowers. And I'm like, oh, thank you very much. You know, so and off you go. And I was chatting to someone afterwards. I said, oh, who's that, you know, nice chap over there? Is he like, you know, uh, Mike's new assistant? He said, no, he's the gold medalist for rowing. Oh. <laughs> and the thing is, because I'd been in the Olympic Park for you the whole seen two weeks, I hadn't seen anything on the telly at all. Oh, that lovely man. Yes, that lovely chap over there. <laughs> I thought he was fit. Yes, really nice. Really yes, good biceps, man. I imagine, yes. if it was yeah. a rower. Good stuff. Um, and then it's sort of full circle, really. Mm. We're talking... Uh, about cancer and your mum looking mm. after your mum and, yeah. and then you mentioned that now you're, you're yeah, my partner yeah um he's um um a victim of a head injury uh, and i've known my partner since we were 17 you so said we're coming that's 40 amazing years now. um and very very shortly uh, those who know uh, my brian um he got hit on the head by a drunk motorcyclist at about 60 miles an hour actually pushing four of our friends out of the way and saving their lives <gasps> Uh, and for years and years and years he had problems, with, you know, because, you know, head injury, you know, memory loss and all sorts of things. But we got together, must have been, ooh, about 18 years ago now. Uh, so I immediately inherited three stepkids, and I'm also a fairy uh, grandmother now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh -huh. um, but he became very ill um, and ended up in hospital, uh, and they wouldn't release him from hospital unless I was there to look after him. So I had to give up my career. Wow. And I ended up as a 24-7 carer. That's tough. Having no experience at that level with it at all. And of course, my bra is six foot four. Yeah, so it's you know, quite difficult yeah, when you, you had to do you know, sort of physical things for yeah, them. Yeah. But we got through it. We got through it. And uh, after about two and a half years, he did very, very much improved and physically stronger. Um, and it was at that point that uh, there was um, uh, a by-election happening locally for East Folkestone. Hey. So I thought, you know what, I was getting really angry about the lack of support for carers and, yeah. you know, people, uh, dis uh, disabled people in the local area. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to throw my hat in because I've been a member of the Labour Party for years. Um, so I thought, oh, go along, I'm really nervous. And this is what I was saying about, be brave, just go and have a go. Um, and I went along to the Labour Party meeting, I did my three minutes, and I got voted as a candidate. And then it's like, well, what do I do now? Yeah. Um, so we did, we had about, I think it was about two weeks campaigning, it wasn't a huge amount, and I got voted in. Yay. And it's just like, okay, what do I do now? I, know, <laughs> I, I actually know nothing about being a councillor, I no. just know what 
I think should happen. That's the thing is, everything's a series of steps, isn't yeah. it? I think people always look look at the bigger leap and don't realise that actually if you do a series of small steps in between one of those yeah. things, yeah. You're, you're making your way there. Yeah, so I had to do lots of reading very quickly. And as I said, <laughs> I, I, I left school with, I think it was four O-levels as they were then. Yeah. Um, but whilst I was at London, uh, London Underground, I took a degree in environmental studies with Open University. Uh-huh. So I got the you know how to read through yeah. and actually do um sort of like the um sort of delve in the research so I, i'm really looking up on all the constitutional things and everything else and the, the town councillors that were on the town here in folkestone were lovely and welcoming they really were um obviously i put a foot wrong here and there because i didn't know all the yeah. ins and outs um but, but no they, they were that, they yeah. were really supportive uh, and then of course we had elections last year and i stood for district as well um, and yes, I'm now town and district, and of course I was mayor last year as well, um, and did over, I think it's about 300 events, and yeah. most of them local, trying to support local projects and local things that are going on. Yeah. So that's sort of me up to date, but I am working full time as well at the moment, just to keep myself busy. Oh yeah, <laughs> what, are you doing? what are you doing, Jackie? Um, well, <laughs> I, I, was, I was lucky having worked on the rails, and having to take that break to look after my blind. Um, and, and this is karma, and this is where I say to everyone, always be kind to people. 20 odd years ago, there was a little support manager in London Underground who didn't have a lot of confidence in herself, but I could see a real spark in her. And I persuaded her boss to allow her to go and do training, and I really boosted her confidence. 20 years later, my CV lands on her desk. Wow. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm in desperate need of a job, because all my savings are gone. Yeah. Um, and within two weeks of putting my CV out, I'd had the interview day, and then I was I was out as a contractor on the railways, wow, which actually saved us. It, you know, I would have lost my house, I would have lost everything, and that's karma. It you is. helped someone twenty years ago, and all of a sudden they've got the chance to help you back. Yeah, that is. It's an amazing. That's an amazing way to finish, Jackie. That's um, you're everything I ever thought you would be, including a really silly laugh. <laughs> emotional. <laughs> I couldn't have asked for a better first. Oh, yes. that is silly. No, seriously. I mean, wow, wow, what a woman. I've just realised that I probably said wow far too much during that whole conversation. Yeah, but you don't know what I want to do when I'm 70. I want to climb Everest when I'm 70. Are you going to? Um, Why are you going well, to wait until you're 70? Because I've, everyone said, I've always said I'm going to dye my hair green when I retire. Right. And that will be under the, the, low, the regime at the moment, about 67. Right. And they said, why do you want to dye it green? I said, because I can. <laughs> um, and I thought, a green-haired 70-year-old walking up Everest, um, that would be a laugh. Yeah. Is but Everest green? You might get lost. They might well, some, some of it is and some of it isn't. But I'm reckoning and I'm hoping by the time I hit 70, they'll actually have an escalator going up it. Yeah, stairlift so, up yeah. Everest. <laughs> All the green-haired old ladies exactly. that want to go. Exactly. Fabulous. Got it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for coming on. And oh, you're more you welcome. Thank you for all the things that you do for Folkestone, which is a town. I'm not from Folkestone, but I'm, I, we've got Custard HQ here. My husband is a Folkestoneite, and I've got lots of family here, and it's got a huge place in my heart. And um, come and visit Folkestone if you haven't been. Oh, and please do. It really is wonderful. It's here. amazing. If you love Brighton, I'd say you'd love Folkestone even more. <laughs> it's um, everything's in a closer vicinity. Yes, yeah, not so much walking. Not so much yeah. walking. Uh, there are probably more steep hills, and the old high street is full of amazing, mm, absolutely uh, unique shops selling things that you just won't find anywhere else. Um, so do do pop along to Folkestone. Come and say hi. At Fol- uh, and take your rubbish home. With you. And, yes, don't just, come, <laughs> don't just come for the beach, although the beaches are lovely, uh, and uh, watch your chips and ice cream and seagulls. Also. Oh yes, I've been mugged by a seagull, that's another story. Uh, so thank you very much, Jackie. Oh, you're more than welcome, and thank you. Oh, this you're thing, welcome. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for listening to Real Folk with me, Joe Burke.